Hi, I'm Jared, and today I'll be reviewing I Came as a Shadow, the autobiography of coach John Thompson, co-authored with Jesse Washington. This book was published just last year in 2020 by Henry Holt and Company, and it's the story of someone who has to be one of the coolest, um, most fascinating characters who's ever lived, ever been a resident of Washington, D.C., ever touched the sports world, ever been associated with Georgetown University, and that is the, you know, one of the greatest coaches of all time, Big John Thompson. This book is um, just about 300 pages long. It's a fun, easy read, um, and it's just packed with tons of fascinating details and anecdotes that really bring this man's amazing life to life. Um, a ton of really rich detail here that I thoroughly enjoyed, um, and as evidenced by the copious uh, post-it notes that I stuck in my hard copy cover of the book. And what I want to talk about in my review today is how uh, Coach Thompson's bio autobiography makes a case, not necessarily um, one that he's specifically arguing, but makes a case, in my opinion, for John Thompson being a historical figure of, of national and even beyond importance. Uh, the trajectory of his life and his legacy touches um, and is part of so many different fascinating trends in American history writ large, in sports culture, in popular culture, in racial history, in the history of education in this country, that he really is, um, in my opinion, a, a seminal American historical figure that I think should be learned about in school um, amongst, our, amongst our young kids for the next generation. So that's what I'm gonna talk about here today. And in order to give you a, a perspective on what I mean by John Thompson as historical figure, we have to zoom back way, way back in history, about 400 years to the early 1600s, um, to 1619, in fact, when the first uh, African people who were enslaved by European um, colonialists were brought to what is now the United States in North America. As we all know, uh, many states in the South and, and indeed up the Eastern seaboard held, um, were home to forced labor camps that we now call plantations, uh, including many in what is now the state of Virginia in Southern, uh, um, and in Maryland. In Southern Maryland, south of what is now Washington, D.C., between the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay, there were many, many of these forced labor camps, including some that had been founded by Jesuits, Jesuits were missionaries and priests and monks of the Catholic faith. Uh, many came to North America and indeed in Maryland, which was a Catholic colony, founded forced labor plantations in which African people who had been enslaved and brought to North America by force um, were forced to work for generations. Um, this is uh, interesting because it's elemental to the, to the founding of America, but in Maryland, the Jesuits converted many of the, the individuals who they held as enslaved people to Catholicism. And so there's this community of people who are now, you know, black Americans living in this area who are Catholic. So that all originated back in the 1600s, 1630s roughly. If you zoom forward in history to about the 1830s, there's a university in what was then, you know, early Washington, D.C., called Georgetown that had also been founded by Jesuits. At this time, Georgetown was in sort of dire financial straits, but the Jesuits also owned, like I said, lots of land in Southern Maryland, lots of individuals who they held as chattel slaves, um, and lots of these forced labor plantations. So what they did, um, seeing that their university was under threat, um, was they sold 272 people, men, women, probably children as well, to uh, forced labor plantations in the Deep South, in Louisiana, where cotton was being farmed. The proceeds from that sale of human lives about $3 million in today's dollars, was used to basically underwrite the future of Georgetown University. So the, the, to make the point explicit, Georgetown University today only exists because of the sale of individuals, of human lives, 
into slave, you know, to another uh, enslaver back in the 1830s. So if you zoom forward again about another uh, 100, 150 years, Georgetown University is a prominent national university. Um, they are looking to raise their profile and they want to do so in part by building a really successful basketball team. And who do they recruit? They recruit a man named John Thompson, a man whose family originated in Southern Maryland um, and for generations had been working either as sharecroppers in the post-Civil War Jim Crow Maryland or for many, many generations, probably indeed centuries, had been enslaved by the Jesuits. Um, we know this because John Thompson, his family, as he writes in the book, were Catholic. They attended Catholic church with white people. They sat in the back of the pews. Catholicism was part of their upbringing because their family originated in this part of Maryland that was you know, basically the former site of a forced labor plantation owned by the Jesuits. Coach John Thompson, of course, goes on to become the most successful basketball coach in Georgetown history. He brings the NCAA championship to Georgetown. He becomes the first black man to do so. And in all these other ways, really embodies the, the history and the greatness of the rise of basketball in American culture. He's really a, a key figure in basketball and sports in general, really becoming a, a huge fixture in American society and culture. Um, and I'm going to get into some of those more details there. But, um, you know, it, it forces you to beg this question or it forces you to ask this question without individuals like John Thompson, without his family who had provided labor to the Jesuits for centuries you know, where would they be today without people like him? And it gets to a point that, that Coach Thompson raises throughout the book. He uses this phrase, I am haunted by my past. And he uses it as a way to explain um, the, the emphasis that he placed on racial justice issues throughout his career, um, to explain his outspoken voice on these issues, and, um, you know, the, the stands that he took that in many ways were unpopular. Um, certainly for, you know, a black man at his time with such a big national profile to advocate forcefully for racial justice issues um, in sports and in academia uh, was not popular, but he did it because, to quote him again, I am haunted by my past. He was born in the Jim Crow South. He was raised in a segregated city. He attained, you know, great things because of what he was able to do with his mind and on the basketball court and just by force of personality. Um, but he never forgot the legacy, the historical legacy um, that, that yielded him as this, as this really unique figure in American history. So that's a, a, a key point that I wanted to make right up front. He is this historical figure um, and he was a history maker in many, many ways. Um, a couple of really interesting vignettes from the book as it traces John Thompson's rise from, you know, a really talented kid, smart kid, um, who was, you know, not seen as smart by his teachers, but was a really talented basketball player through to, you know, the heights of the sports world. Um, very early on, a kid in Washington, D.C., uh, one of the, the most prominent players at the time in the area was Elgin Baylor who went on to become one of the greatest basketball players of all time. There's a vignette in the book where John Thompson is at a playground in DC with literally thousands of people watching a scrimmage pickup game between Elgin Baylor and Wilt Chamberlain. You know, two of the probably top five players of all time in NBA history, just going at it on the basketball court in Washington, DC. And there you have in the, you know, in the spectator group, uh, Coach John Thompson, who went on to become another seminal figure in basketball. Pretty amazing little vignette there. After, you know, formative experiences like that, he goes on to win a high school championship. He, of course, later wins the NCAA college championship with Georgetown. But he also picked up an NBA championship along the way during his playing career with Red Auerbach's Boston Celtics. And he won an Olympic gold medal as an assistant coach in the 70s. Um, so literally every, you know, attainment that you could make as a, as a basketball professional, he made. Um, really, really remarkable stuff. 
Um, and in this way, his career traced the trajectory of basketball's rise as a mega sport. And along the way, his path intersected with all these other basketball and sports legends. You've got Bill Russell, who is his teammate on the Boston Celtics. Like, you, like I said, you've got Red Auerbach, one of the greatest coaches of all time, um, who was a mentor to John Thompson um, while he was playing for the Celtics and beyond. You've got Dean Smith, another one of the most legendary coaches of the North Carolina Tar Heels, who coached uh, Michael Jordan when he was <laughs> with North Carolina. He was another critical mentor for John Thompson. You have Michael Jordan himself. Uh, the year before Georgetown won their national championship, uh, that they were play Georgetown was again in the national championship game playing North Carolina. Um, the North Carolina team led by Dean Smith and Michael Jordan won over Georgetown. So their careers intersected early on, um, as well as Patrick Ewing, who really helped deliver the championship to Georgetown as a player under Coach Thompson and then went on to have a stupendous NBA career, largely with the New York Knicks, and now has returned to Georgetown uh, to be their head basketball coach. You also have Allen Iverson, who was a, a famous basketball character when I was growing up in the 90s and the 2000s, um, who really kind of shaped the culture that basketball took on in that era and, and brought sort of a new sensibility that was infused with a lot of the things that he picked up and learned under, or under John Thompson's wing at Georgetown, but was also influenced by his own background and his own upbringing in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. Um, the book also is fascinating because it gives a really like firsthand deep dive into Coach Thompson's uh, coaching philosophy, which was all um, tied up with his focus on education. And this is one of the things he says in the book, that John Thompson was, first of all, before anything else, he was an educator. He had a master's degree in education. He wanted to be a teacher. And in his words, you know, he was a teacher. His classroom was the basketball court. Uh, and that was one of the, the main defining features of his program at Georgetown was the emphasis he placed on academics almost above all else. Uh, he was in his words, the first major program coach to hire an academic assistant. Uh, these days, most of the major programs give this kind of lip service to student athletes, placing emphasis on academics in addition to, in addition to athletics. Um, that really originated with Coach Thompson, and he was the one, I think, it seems through the book, who really kind of set the standard that you know, many other schools have struggled to maintain over the years. And he gives some good statistics about, you know, the guys who stayed at Georgetown for four years as players, virtually all of them graduated with degrees and have gone on to do great things. So it's a really, um, it's a really important distinction for him that he holds, holds very dear. Um, a couple of other elements of his teaching philosophy that I found particularly resonant, even beyond sports, was one that he picked up, I think from Red Arbach, which is that 70% of the factors that go into winning a game occur off the court, okay? So, you know, 30% of a win is, is all tied up with the goings on on the court. 70% is all the other stuff around it. The officiating, where your team is staying, how they're preparing, the mentality that you're bringing, the academic factor, all these other things, that was such a huge part of how Coach Thompson, you know, orchestrated his highly successful program. Um, another thing that he picked up, I believe also from Red Arbach, was when evaluating players, when evaluating talent, you know, you, you want to look at what they do when they have the ball, when they're handling, handling the ball on the court, dribbling, shooting, passing, etc. But you also want to look at what they're doing off the ball. How are they getting themselves in position for assists? How are they getting themselves in positions to set up screens and picks? Like, how are they hustling on the full court press and getting back to the other end after the rebound? Like, these are really critical things that can tell you a lot about, you know, a player's character and their readiness to perform at the next level. And I think that's something that applies not just in sports. You know, you got to look at what people are doing, not only when they're in the limelight, not only when... Um, all the focus is on them. You have to look at everything else, all the other confluence of factors that come in. And then finally, 
Throughout his career, John Thompson placed this huge emphasis on standing up for what he thought was right, um, especially when it came to doing right by his players, many of whom, like him, grew up poor, grew up disadvantaged, grew up in, you know, either uh, uh, recently desegregated or fully segregated backgrounds, basically. Um, and he wanted to make sure he protected and defended the opportunities that they had. So this, you know, the example of this is his famous walk-off of a game in the 80s um, due to NCAA's, the NCAA's Proposition 42, which would have placed new restrictions on academic qualifications that would have overwhelmingly disadvantaged black players over white players. So moving beyond his coaching philosophy, another thing that I found absolutely fascinating about this book was John Thompson's career as a sports businessman. Um, and and the, the example of this is his relationship with Nike. So uh, think back to 1972, our contemporary sort of sneaker, sportswear, culture, and business basically does not exist. You've got Adidas, you've got Converse, you've got some of these other brands uh, but Nike is virtually, you know, unknown. And so in 1972, John Thompson flies out either to California or Oregon, and he meets Phil Knight when they were still operating out of like hotel rooms in Portland, Oregon. And he, you know, notices that this guy has an interesting operation, um, and he becomes a part of, you know, the Nike crew. He gets a contract for endorsement with Nike. Um, and he becomes basically their highest paid endorsing coach um, and eventually becomes a member of the Nike board of directors, um, which is just really remarkable. Um, he, of course, becomes fabulously wealthy because of this relationship with Nike. Um, but he got in on the ground floor with Phil Knight and, and, and was there every step of the way as Nike went on this meteoric rise to, to the absolute apex of the sports business merchandise world. You know, of course, the, the Air Jordan, the Michael Jordan phenomenon had a huge part in this. But John Thompson and Georgetown basketball also played a major, major role in popularizing Nike as a brand amongst, you know, the black kids across the country who looked up to Georgetown basketball as this amazing example of, you know, sports and cultural cachet. Um, so, you know, he goes on to describe his, his career as a Nike board member where he was, you know, rubbing elbows with CEOs and with U.S. presidents. Um, you know, it's, it's really remarkable stuff. Um, so to, to wrap up the review, I want to talk a little bit about the, the title of the book, which I think is a really cool title, I Came as a Shadow. And the title is inspired by a poem, in fact. So John Thompson's uncle was a poet, believe it or not, um, and his name was Louis Grandison Alexander. Uh, he was active during the Harlem Renaissance period. He, you know, knew and worked with uh, Langston Hughes, County Cullen, um, all that milieu of um, really famous and innovative Harlem Renaissance poets, and uh, he penned this poem that was part of John Thompson's life growing up because his uncle lived with his family for a while. And so he grew to know him, grew to, grew to know him. Um, and it's a really lovely poem. And I think it encapsulates a lot of how Coach Thompson saw himself and his life and his position in broader history and in broader American culture. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the poem to kind of wrap things up here. So... The, it's called Nocturne Varial, and here's how it goes. I came as a shadow, I stand now a light. The depth of my darkness transfigures your night. My soul is a nocturne, each note is a star. The light will not blind you, so look where you are. The radiance is soothing, there's warmth in the light. I came as a shadow to dazzle your night. Beautiful poem, great uh, tagline, great uh, first line to use as the title for this book, um, and just gives you an, you know, an idea of the, the depth and the intellect and the sophistication of this man's career and life, and really reinforces you know, my view that he is this kind of national and world historical figure that we should all be thinking more about. 
Um, you know, certainly a legend in just DC history, regional history, certainly in sports history. Um, but you can learn a lot more about it by picking up the book. Um, you know, the autobiography, it's of John Thompson. It was co-written with Jesse Washington, who's a sports writer, uh, who did a, a really wonderful job at kind of translating this, this big and broad life story into a, uh, into a narrative that's, that's pretty darn compelling. So go pick it up. I got the hard copy online. I Came as a Shadow, Autobiography of John Thompson. It's a great read. Highly recommended. Thanks for watching.